Welcome back to the Citizen Channel as we continue to chart the history of Manchester City from 1880. Yes, and we've got to 1971, 1972. Yes, uh, these are the sort of seasons now when I was there as a regular going certainly to all the main road games or certainly most of the main road games. Still a couple of years away though from going to the starting going to away game. So that'll get even more interesting when we get to that stage. Yeah, so we're going to have a look at 1971-72. Please, if you are new to the channel and not subscribed, please push that subscribe button. We do City Past, Present, Forever on, on this channel. So, uh, please, if you can tell your friends, any City fans that might be interested, that would be great. Please, all thumbs up. I'm much appreciated going forward. And uh, please check out my little film and TV channel as well, where I do film reviews and TV drama reviews and information vlogs on there. Right, so 1971-72, personally, yes, I was at Parswood High School then. Uh, I certainly went to as many games as I could. Uh, it's very hard to remember back how many games I went to, uh, how many I missed, but I tried, uh, you know, I was more or less trying to get to them all within, within the constraints of uh, paying that junior junior entrance fee at the, at the old turnstiles there. And, of course, I've changed from the Platte Lane uh, from being younger. I've changed to the Kipax now. Hey, it was... A, I was at high school once, of course. I was in the Kipax now. Uh, yeah, I was, and I was obviously going, started going now on a regular basis with a, with a big blue and my best friend from Parswood, a lad called Chris, who would go on to be a regular with me at the away games as well initially in the in the mid mid to late seventies. Uh, yeah, I'd been going with David, uh, David, my main or uh, best friend whilst we were at junior school, but obviously he'd, he'd gone to Willowbrook, I'd gone to Parswood, so we sort of drifted apart as you tend to do when you go to high school. You make new friends, etc. And uh, Chris, this uh, this mate of mine, his birthday was just four days before mine. And mine's the sixth of July. His is the second of July. He was definitely a lad you wanted in the trenches beside you and especially especially having your back, of course, following our wonderful club up and down the country uh, and the troubles, obviously, in the 70s, uh, the, the word. He was the sort of guy you, you sort of could rely on. He could rely on in a scrape, let's, let's put it that way, but more on that in future episodes as we look further into City's history. City, yeah, the 70-71 season. If you please go back and watch all these if you've not watched them yet. But uh, it was a frustrating one uh, on and off the pitch. The boardroom problems, as I say, we'd, we'd brought in. I finished the last uh, the last vlog talking about Mr Swales had been brought in to sort of bring all parties together. Yeah, well, that, that ended well, didn't it? Eventually, Mr Swales was brought in as a director. So there's still problems. And obviously the board was sort of split. You had your uh, Alison backers who obviously were, the, were the, to the to the fore now. They they were taking control. And you guys who obviously had still had respect for Joe Mercer, but we'll talk about that today. And Big Win Davis, yes, on the player front, we got Big Win Davis, the mighty win. You'll not see nothing like the mighty win. That was a good song. We got him for uh, £52,000. Yeah, with other players, Glimpardo, of course, was still coming back from the broken leg, uh, a fracture so not so bad that he was he was in minutes of actually losing his leg, and it would be November nineteen seventy two before we'd actually see him playing the first team again. And despite making this comeback, in the same way like Colin Bell, perhaps, and and, and Paul Lake, it, it was never right at the age of twenty four when he did suffer this. Injury, of course, involving uh, infamous injury involving George Best, who he never held a, a grudge against or, or any animosity against. Uh, effectively, at the age of twenty-four, that was it. That he said he did make a comeback, but it didn't really work. It, it never, it never was quite right again. It effectively robbed him of a potentially a fantastic career. It was a great left back, and of course, City lost a great left back as well. So. What could have been with with uh, Glimpardo? Uh, Oaks and Bell were also struggling with flinges at the start of this season, but Main Road had a different look. Yeah, with the North Stand, uh, with its new terracing and its famous, a new famous or infamous, depending which way you look at it, scoreboard, which was quite good at the time. It was only one row, one row of letters, but hey, you, you know, compared to other clubs, it, it was it was like something from the science fiction. It, it was absolutely amazing. And of course, the scoreboard will become the place to go for for most of the city faithful. I, I I never actually went in that. I only went in it when it was seats. I never went in it when there was standing. Uh, but obviously, a lot a lot of people uh, from the Kipax went in, and actually, uh, the the actual 
atmosphere, if you like, certainly improved, and, and obviously you ended up with an end. And I think a lot of fans like the the, the fact of standing in an end rather than a side, which was unusual. A little bit more of that in a moment. I mean, even even Tony Book commented that uh, once people were in there, it helped lift the atmosphere all round the ground. So not not just from the north stand, but the whole stadium. Of course, this this was. This was the sort of thing of uh, Eric Alexander, wasn't it? Of Mr. Al- the director Alexander, uh, sorry, Chairman Alexander. That, that was his baby, this new stand. He had lots and lots of plans going forward. And this North Stand was one of his, his impressive initiatives, if you like. But going forward, the new board would sort of stop backing him for this and all his all his thoughts and hopes of what he could do for City in the future were, were a little bit stymied by this uh, new board going forward. Uh, Alison had also asked uh, groundsman Stan Gibson uh, to widen the pitch by a couple of yards. So it's, I think it was about 117 by 79 now, one of the biggest uh, in the actual league. So obviously the plans plans to use that more space, that was that was Alison's plan, uh, one of his tactics. Of course, Joe Mercer was, was still in charge when the season kicked off for the visit of Leeds for the opening game uh, where Wynn Davies would make his debut. Uh, sadly, in a 1-0 defeat, though. And this season saw City also take part in what was called the Texaco Cup, which featured English, Scottish and Irish clubs. And we drew the first leg uh, with Airdrie at Main Road. I'm not 100% sure I was there, guys. I'm fairly sure I was. And then we lost the away leg, leg, unfortunately. So it was was a short but not so very sweet adventure in that competition. Uh, That was our first, first foray into it. On the 5th of October, we went out of the League Cup. Obviously, we'd won the League Cup back in 1970. We went out of the League Cup at the second hurdle, a 3-0 loss at uh, Bolton Wanderers uh, at Burnham Park. Bolton Wanderers, of course, visited there many times over the years. On the 9th of October, yes, officially 1971, Malcolm Allison took charge of City for the very first time in a 1-0 win over Everton. Although, of course, the match day programme was printed, still had Mercer in charge, there's no mention of Allison in there. But, of course, the boardroom chain change had seen that Joe Mercer moved to, to what was sort of a general manager, but obviously in the match day programme, he was just going to be called a manager, and obviously Allison would be called team manager. Alison was a happy chappy. Uh, Mercer not so much, but a little bit, a little bit more on that as well in a minute. Obviously, with the effects on Mercer and what happened with him going forward. Uh, by the Sheffield United game on the twenty third of October, Alison, of course, was finally listed as team manager and Mercer simply manager. Yeah, so the, it'll be on the screen there. But that's that's how they actually framed it. And Merce, Mercer accepted this. He knew, he knew it was going to happen. There's no big problem. There's no big problem. There's no 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 hatred uh, between the two guys. They've had fallouts, of course. We have talked about that in previous episodes of this, but uh, of course, Alison was a team manager, uh, and but Mercer was left with a little bit of a problem. He he wasn't really sure what his role would be, uh, as the board didn't want to confuse things. They didn't they didn't, they didn't like the word manager. Obviously, Alison was the team manager, but they didn't want to give John Mercer any sort of uh, any sort of title that had the word manager manager lay in it. So. When it came to uh, a thrilling 3-3 derby at Main Road, yes, yeah, City lay third by the time of this uh, derby at, at Main Road on November the 6th. And this, this match itself was immortalised, not by some of his last-minute equaliser, which uh, saved the game for City, but more so by footage that you can still see now, which it's become immortalised, of Francis Lee imitating a dive to the referee in response, of course, to a George Best tumble in the box. Uh, many, even City, many, very, even City fans thought this was a bit of a pot call in the kettle black, if you like, with uh, Francis Lee's reputation for going down, well, let's say, too easily. He would deny that, of course. Of course he would. And Lee would score a record 13 pens this season, but only a handful were actually awarded for, for fouls on Lee himself. So, I mean, even though obviously that was a reputation he got, that wasn't particularly the case. And Lee would later claim for every pen we actually got, a penalty we actually got, because City was such a tr- strong attacking force at that time, but for every one we got, there's probably 20 we didn't. That was that, obviously exaggerating slightly, but that's the point he was making at the time. It all seemed to be going well. Said there's still problems with Mercer's position and what he what he was meant to do, but uh, yeah, Alison won the November Manager of the Month award, so it was all it was all pretty rosy. 
But as I said, Joe Mercy had been promised. He promised he had been promised. Uh, well, he didn't get it in writing, probably, but this is what he should have done: a job for life at sitting on the board of director or something like that. And it, it would have been easy to make him a director, but they balked at that. They didn't want to do that. But he actually found himself having to take a pay cut. He was t- taking a pay cut, which okay, he wasn't the, the team manager anymore, so perhaps not unreasonable. But this this uh, job for life had turned to a, into a mere three year contract. <laughs> So, obviously, Mercer was getting treated very badly. And many of the new board, and, and of course, uh, Malcolm Allison's backers, uh, began to treat Mercer with contempt. He lost his car parking space, so he didn't even have a place to park his car. His name was taken off his office door. There was no, you know, no office, and well, there was an office, but he didn't have his name on it anymore. And as previously stated, they didn't want to use the word manager in and around him, although obviously in the programmes, it still, still had him listed as manager for the, for the rest of that season. So, I mean, obviously, the, the reason for that was they said they just didn't want to take legitimacy away from Alison's role. But, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, as I said, it, if it had been sort of decided, I think Alexander tried to, to broker a little bit of peace. We'll talk again, and we'll touch on that later on. But, you know, why it, it made him a director. I think Joe, Miss Joel Mercer would have been very, very happy with that situation, to be honest with you. Uh, strangely enough, yeah, even Alison, uh, even though obviously the board was backing him, had his problems as well. I mean, he actually sent his contract or, or mulled his contract over with a, with a lawyer. And he actually, they actually said it wasn't worth the paper it was written on. So obviously there's a lot of problems uh, off the pitch still at the board level. Uh, and this would continue to to have problems over the next couple of seasons as the board would, would change uh, time and time again, which uh, just didn't help the club as a whole in that period. But on the pitch, still, it wasn't doing too. We weren't doing too bad. On December 11th, a 4 0 home win against Ipswich, but City second, just four points behind United. It was two points for a win in those days, don't forget. But by the 9th of January, City were only, were only one point behind the Leeds United after a draw at Tottenham. But we'd gone out of the FA Cup after a third round replay at 1 0 at Middlesbrough. But this, this allowed Alisson to simply state that uh, it would allow us to concentrate on the league. And yeah. By the end of January, City were two points clear at the top after a 5-2 win over Wolverhampton Wanderers. By the 1st of March, we were four points clear, so things were going pretty well. Uh, This was despite a 3-0 loss at Anfield, which was uh, a bit devastating at the time at the end of February. But uh, Leeds in second did have a couple of games in hand as well, so they had to win them. Uh, But I think the City had turned uh, a three or four point disadvantage into a four point advantage, so everything was going uh, pretty well. But on um, well, but I'll say but but then, then the 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 last the last piece of the jigsaw. So City thought, so the fans thought, so they were told, so the board thought. On the 18th of March, a certain striker named Rodney Marsh uh, came from QPR and made his debut. He cost two hundred thousand pound, but uh, yeah, a, a quality addition. And this was, as I said, this was believed by uh, neutrals and City fans alike to be the, the clincher for City just to go on and lift the title again for the second time in, in in five years in his first match we beat Chelsea just 1-0 though so it was emphatic but the fans soon took to Marsh they liked, they liked Rodney Marsh they liked, they liked his swagger they liked how he played uh, but there was already a hint that his teammates perhaps weren't as impressed and uh, obviously this new interloper I mean uh, Tony Towers had been playing regular and playing very very well but obviously he lost his base as soon as Marsh came uh, and Mike Doyle himself admitted that Marsh, Marsh had tried to mix there was nothing wrong with what Marsh he wasn't he wasn't aloof or anything like that but uh, he, he did prefer to do his own thing Marsh and he wasn't really a, a team a total team player and Doyle said it affected the rhythm of the team uh, and that was then obviously starting to get backed up by results on the pitch a draw at Newcastle and two defeats uh, to Stoke at home uh, where Gordon Banks had a world class display against City and away at Southampton left City now back in third so we dropped to third on 50 points Derby were top on 51 Liverpool second on 50 and Leeds were fourth on 49 points Later, it also became known that Marsh had been playing with a bit of a groin strain as well. He hadn't been fully fit, but Alisson had persisted with him. Until the derby, yeah, until the derby match at Old Trafford on April the 12th, when he was surprisingly named a sub. City had a good recent record at Old Trafford, done very, very well. And despite going behind, we won the game 3-1. 
with Marsh coming on for an injured Doyle and scoring the third goal and totally winding up the Old Trafford faithful by going into the corners and, and just holding on to the ball as we, we did many, obviously, a long, many years after that. We, we always remember the famous time of City wasting time in the corners at, at Old Trafford when we were winning and taking the mick, to be honest with you. And Rodney Marsh did exactly the same. The United players just couldn't get the ball off him. And this this win over United, of course, brought City back into the race. But again, they, they fell flat. Another draw with two games left. They were a point behind Derby, so we're still still struggling. So we sort of won one, and then we just 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 didn't manage to keep that run up. We didn't we didn't do win after win. Uh, and Leeds, so we're a point behind Derby. Leeds and Liverpool also had games in hand. So it wasn't looking that great. And on April the 18th, City had to go to Portman Road, had to go to Ipswich and defeat them. But uh, sadly, we failed. And though City would, of course, uh, have to face Derby in the final game, a 2-0 victory didn't really matter. It put City top by a point. But the problem was Derby still had to play Liverpool. And even a draw, draw between those two wins or a victory for either would knock City off top spot because they both had a better goal average than City. So it, even though we went top after that magnificent win against Derby County, it didn't, we knew we couldn't win the title. It was all over. And Liverpool also had an extra game after that even. So, in fact, Derby beat Liverpool uh, to go top and then claim the title. And Liverpool, because Liverpool could only draw their last game, so they couldn't catch Derby County anyway. And it ended up with City finishing fourth uh, on the same points as Liverpool and Leeds, but a worse goal average and obviously just, just a point behind Derby County who we'd beat in our last game of the season. So, in a season that looks as though City could ease to another title, uh it was a bit of a disaster. Ended up a bit of a disaster. Uh, to be unkind, uh, some people said he might look like a one-horse race in March uh, with City clear. Uh, typical City finish fourth in what should have been a one-horse race. So, yeah, it's probably well put, to be honest with you. A lot of things to blame, of course, there was, but most, most, of course, even to this day, blame the arrival of Rodney Marsh. And he himself said that it probably did cost us the title, and he's thoroughly upset about it because he only has praise for the City fans. He said that the City fans deserve that title, and my arrival disrupted things. And he spoke fondly the support he would get, and the, the song we used to sing, Oh, Rodney, Rodney, of course, he used to love that song. Uh, and personally, there was... Personally, uh, there was a lot more to it than the Marsh, I think, uh, than uh, costing us that. I mean, a world-class display by Gordon Banks in the Stoke 2-1 win at Main Road uh, was another thing cited as being the turning point in the season. Don't forget, we, lost, we only lost the title by one point, so that was zero points. If we won that game, we would have got two points. So that was another reason. There were other factors as well. So even though Rodney Marsh does claim, yes, he accepts responsibility, I think he's been a little bit, a little bit hard on himself, uh, to be honest with you. But I think that's just because uh, he just had such a good relationship with us, the fans, to be honest with you. And even, even to this day, he's got an excellent relationship with, with us, the fans, even though things didn't quite work out and say a lot of people uh, did blame his arrival for us failing to win the league. And going back to the boardroom, going back to Mr. Joe Mercer, I mean, the inve inevitable happened. Uh, an unappreciated Joe Mercer, and that's how he felt, joined Coventry City in the, fall, the, the June after the season finished as a uh, general manager. And of course, uh, Chairman Alexander still tried to mend bridges, but it was all a bit too late by then. Uh, and again, this directorship was never offered. So it just uh, by that time, Joe Mercer had had enough and who could blame him? And uh, many fans were upset by this, as, as we would be. You know, this guy had, had, had turned City in, into so much success in the late 60s with Malcolm Allison. And a lot of fans were a bit devastated by it. Uh, and some fell out with the club over it. I mean, some some possibly never came back to watch City again. Obviously, some some do and some some didn't. But a lot of fans fell out with City for the way uh, Joe Mercer was treated, which was, was quite correct. So there you go, 70, 71, 72 season. I saw a City that's uh, a season that saw City throw away a chance of a second title in five years. And perhaps even more importantly and shockingly, also throw away one of the greatest managers in our history, in Joe Mercer. 
Well, there you go. On the pitch, an improvement at 70 71 as far as league position. Uh, and players like Willie Donicke, yeah, and Tony Towers had also proved the worth that season. And yet again, optimism would be high for the 72 73 season. But fallout from the loss of Joe Mercer was to cast a shadow over the upcoming, upcoming season, 72-73. So join, join me for that when I've done that and uh, hope you enjoy that. Let me know any memories you've got. It'd be fantastic to hear from you. Anyway, thanks for watching. Have a good rest of the day. Have a great one. Look after yourselves. Look after your friends. Look after your families. More important, let's all look after each other for me here again on the City and Channel. I only ask one thing, don't I? Please stay safe, Blues. Come on, City. Thanks for watching. <laughs>